What's up? Oh. Hello, world. This is CS50 Explained Week 3. My name is David Malin, and we're here with CS50's friend, Dan Armandaris. Hey, everyone. Let's take a look at Week 3. All right, this is CS50. You're wearing that white shirt again. No, it's actually a light purple. Three. Is it? So, it is. Up until oh, now, are you sure it's not just dirty? A <laughs> it's, a, it's a light purple, which is actually problematic for some of our videography because it is so close to white, and it tends to be hard to capture the, the shirt and the backdrop uh, properly. Mm. So in this week three, uh, more to the point, um, we begin to introduce command line arguments. We dive in more deeply to arrays, which we introduced last week, and and we begin to scratch the surface of memory management and actually what's going on really underneath the hood. We'll also transition to, in this week, a little bit away from the syntax that is driven, weeks one and two, at least we'd say, and focus even more on ideas and algorithms. Indeed, we'll introduce some of the first of our searching and sorting. In fact, we have some, some great demonstrations. Right today. <laughs> Looks like you have some music stands ready to go. Yeah, I wonder what that means. Suppose that we actually wanted to start writing programs that are a little more versatile and frankly, a little more like the commands that you've been getting, hopefully a little bit. But this is, this is the week like where things CD really start to get fun for me, at least. I think this the material, right. especially as we transition to algorithms proper, uh, affords an opportunity to really like this, do some fun demonstrations, bring students up on stage, and indeed that's what the music stands are currently alluding to. When, did the, when does the material get fun for students? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was week zero onward. Oh, was yeah, it? Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> you might have missed that. Week zero of when we... Was it week zero, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Week zero <laughs> so this was a conscious decision too this past year to emphasize even more using make as the starting point for compilation as opposed to dwelling a little too much on clang. Um, in the past year we did a little too much of the latter where I emphasized using clang and maybe dash o and so forth and it's fine for the simplest of programs but as soon as you want to start linking in certain libraries like CS50s or others, uh, commands like this become in fact, a little less case, memorable and a little more unwieldy. So we've kept things simpler, us, at least with Make, and then later in the semester, do students really start to see the complexity of the client command, the which frankly you should rarely if ever have to run manually so anyway. This? But we do want them to know what's going on in underneath the hood. We're going to start adding and so here, too, it's yellow. worth noting that we've been using the CS50 library for the past couple of weeks, among whose functions are getString, which allows you to get a uh, text from the user at a blinking prompt. But we haven't yet done anything at the command line, but we've cer certainly been taking it for granted, given that we're running Clang with so-called command line arguments. And so today, we tried to transition away from exclusively using the CS50 library to get, command line, uh, to get user input to using command line arguments to do the same. Not so much because they themselves are that intellectually interesting, but because it affords us an opportunity to really start talking about arrays in more detail, both at the string level and then even at the character by character level. Array. So it looks at first glance like it's a string. So running, how much did we talk about arrays in the past week? Time, we relatively little. We uh, tried an array, to motivate the introduction of arrays of by of the ages uh, example, context. which recall I introduced an age one an variable, an age two variable, age three variable to store three persons' ages. But very quickly does that become aesthetically and then hopefully sort of intuitively messy. And so we then motivated the introduction of arrays by saying, well, what if we just had an ages array, which itself can contain any number? Number that has of no ages, number so long as we know in advance. Mm -hmm. When you specify, as I have here, the name this of is an unfortunate like v, which is just a uh, syntactical detail, though, of C, whereby for declaring an array, at least in this context, you would simply do open bracket, close bracket, no mention, of course, of the size of the array. Um, but when you actually declare the array itself um, within on the stack, inside of a function, of course, you specify the size of the array in that context. And so this overloading, so to speak, of syntax uh, definitely gives some students pause early on. When do you put the number? When do you not put the number? Hmm. And, then and we there. also, too, at this so point, haven't talked like? about Let's passing an array picture. around, so which can either involve using the square brackets or or in some contexts, you could pass it by pointer if it's actually a block of memory you're passing around but treating as an array. One is do you find students really do get tripped up by that? Syntax? Not, less so with the square bracket notation, but particularly so with the star so notation, which we'll soon get to with dereferencing versus declaring a pointer. Counts. So this is kind and of the simpler analog I've of that. Drawn, hmm. I've drawn argv as an array, and I don't really know how long it's going to be. So this so is an interesting thing that I've wrestled with over time as to how to present or depict 
um, so things like argv, because of course argv is really an array of pointers, char star pointers, and yet, I don't, but a, a char star of course is a string, which itself is an array of characters, and so capturing that with a diagram isn't necessarily the simplest picture to paint. So right now we're abstracting away from what argv zero and one and two and three and so forth are, and ultimately we'll hope that students understand that within each of those cells is effectively an array, or more properly, a pointer to an array of characters. So now let's actually but we'll get there. For now, we're keeping it simple by just modeling hello, strings on a higher a level. Do you actually modify this diagram in some way to make what more clear that point? Um, at some points, it, I've, it's varied by year. Sometimes I actually do things on the fly by drawing. Um, more recently, I've tried to do more of that a priori with, with actual pictures and slides, just so I get it just right. In other words, the computer somehow and as an aside, this is another perhaps historical detail worth noting. It's, it's particularly not obvious to students to one to run a command at a blinking prompt these days, but two to have to do something more arcane like dot slash hello to run a program called hello. And so years ago, we actually simply added dot to one's default path so that it was uh, the program hello would sort of be magically discovered so long as it's in the current working directory. This, of course, is not ideal because you can then trick someone into executing a command like. Like uh, hello, that's on the system, um, as opposed to in their uh, rather that's in a current working directory, as opposed to the system uh, version thereof, or more properly, something like CD or LS. You could in theory trick someone into running a program called that if you just assume that anything in your current directory is runnable. So we've moved away from that to the more proper expectation of dot slash. That seems interesting that you sort of fix that quote unquote for them by by doing that. Do you find that that backfires at all if students move away? From if I do and well, to other but that's exactly it. We don't put dot in their path anymore. Instead, we expect oh, them to I always type dot slash. I would say okay. that was a mistake back so in, in at least I think 2007. This array when we did that. might be dot 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 of some variable length, so to speak. You always know where the end of it is because argc is going to tell you at what point you have to stop. Looking at elements I think this is a helpful paradigm to propose, where we've shown them the command so clang dash o and so forth, and we've shown them dot slash hello and now Zamila, and actually kind of depicting so it in a familiar, in a hopefully now familiar way, or standard way, helps paint the picture of what's really going on in memory. Let's just get a simplified level here. This is interesting that you show this array that still has a bigger size. Size, even though the arg count, even though the count of args is less than the, the size of the array, was that sort of a deliberate decision to sort of? Oh, that's a good point. There's an implication there that oh, there's still the memory that exists, but well, yeah, and that's definitely true, of, right? But you now don't I'm explicitly show the end of array. Well, you show the the count, but that's about it. Yeah, that's fair. And um, I think I would admit that I just didn't think too hard about how to depict it. I think, if anything, I wanted to use the same picture for all of these demonstrations so that only the contents were changing and not the the pictures. Um, but I don't disagree that we could clean this up further by doing exactly that. put whatever word the user typed after the program's name. So if I do dot slash hello space Zamila, I want to somehow programmatically access quote unquote Zamila. So I can go into my argument. And this is deliberate. It's a simple thing, but choosing specific names again, of staff or hello, students, um, I think is a nice minor touch that customizes the material as opposed to using one. more because generic Errol, zero, Alice or Bob or Charlie or some textbook style name. name as we saw. So bracket one is the first other word Alice and Bob and Charlie being type. the canonical go-to names, at least this. in the security world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into my folder. And this is, I think we've talked about this in the past, but zooming in and enabling these accessibility features is super key, especially as we're diving into even more intricate code here. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Are you going to scratch your I think I fixed my hair, which might mean I was trying to remember what went wrong here. I don't remember if this was deliberate or not, but the program, of course, is called hello-3, not hello. But let's call it a good teaching teachable moment. Enter, and now we have hello, Zamila. Meanwhile, I can change this to be Rob or really any other word. 
but let's consider a corner case. What might you expect will happen? This is a good. Well, this is a deliberate message I try to send early on. These so-called corner error cases, or sorts, you know, what let's cases see. should you be Enter. testing and should you be thinking of no. testing? So printf is and testing a little names ad nauseum might not be the most compelling thing. Maybe testing a really long name, really short name, sure. But testing a whole bunch of staff names probably isn't super compelling. But testing no names, for instance, or other such corner cases, I think is pretty a pretty good sort of paranoia to instill in folks to always get them thinking about like, okay, what could be wrong here? How formal do you get into the discussion of debugging and trying to come up with cases and test cases? Um, it's a good question. I think we, we don't use, for instance, a unit testing framework within the class, and we aren't a test. For, we don't have a test first driven approach in the class, which is common among some classes to emphasize creation of tests, um, either given to you or for your own code. Um, so I think we work our way up to that, but right now we kind of take on the burden of writing tests for students in the form of the check 50 command, which has upsides and downsides. The downside of which, though, is that we don't necessarily get students really into the habit of thinking about how to test their own code. In fact, one of my frustrations for the past few years is we've used check 50 in the class. Um, both online and on campus, is that we see students in office hours especially using it as a crutch. So they'll uh, create the, the first version of their program, and then rather than even run Clang or Make, they'll run Check 50. And then even the first test will fail because, of course, the first test in Check 50 is usually to try compiling the code. And that pains me because I'd prefer students be a little more in the habit of using Check 50 when they're reasonably sure that they have either all full correctness or at least they want to test now that their code is indeed correct. Correct, but minimally, it should certainly compile. We so we've been toying with alternatives to check 50 and, and you know, maybe rate limiting today, the frequency with which you can run it, which I don't I love the idea of, but maybe that would help students help themselves, or maybe now, the computer um, capping the number of times you can use it. But we haven't gone that far since I, I prefer, for now, at least a more liberal approach. If you've ever wondered the extent to which I give myself notes or comments, this is the extent of it, at least for this slide. So the hello 3 and the presenter notes, the keynote there, is just to remind me to show Hello 3 around this time in the lecture. Who knows what's there. How much do you find that you veer significantly away from what it was you wanted to talk about in the slides? So while you're preparing, preparing these slides, you might have gone over uh, some of the material in your head, but then as you start thinking about it, or if you start talking about it in class, then you might veer off in some other direction. Not you too often. Sometimes we'll leapfrog over material for lack of time or just because I realize mm, this, does, this wasn't the right flow. It sounded good in my head that morning, but it didn't really work in reality. So sometimes I'll quickly minimize the screen, the slides, and jump to some future slide. That's not too common these days. Um, I would say the thing I tend, the, the response that comes to mind is that I think too often I start using too many words at the start of a lecture or I spend too much time on the earliest material and then realize a little too late that we really have a lot more uh, points that I want to hit during the lecture. And so, so we then tend to accelerate. So I've been trying to get better at that, whereby we start at the same pace with which we finish. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the past few minutes you've been doing an example where you try to access portions of the array that are outside the limits of RC. So what what is the? Are you trying to make a point about the security of this sort of? Ultimately, uh, yeah, absolutely. Ultimately, the security or more the power that C gives you and the danger that C invites, whereby you can just touch any memory you want for better or for worse. And here we're going to introduce a at least one way for coding defensively to make sure that at least in this context we're not overstepping the bounds of RV. Zero is good. It doesn't mean false per se. Zero is good, and any non-zero value the world has decided can signify an error. So if you've ever messed something up on your computer, or a program has just died on you, and you've gotten some ero uh, erroneous window on your screen saying error negative It's always been sort of funny that that's been the case, that zero has represented. Value, that's because a programmer has hard uh, uh, I mean, the, I suppose the way I think about it is, did this program run successfully? The question, mm -hmm. did this program run successfully? And a zero represents the value so true in, in that context, in that I agree. Of thought, which is, is counterintuitive, for sure. Right. In yeah. And the, the way I try to assure students that this is reasonable is that, well, if it's correct, it's correct, but there's also an infinite number of things that could be wrong, or at least four billion things that might go wrong if you're using 32 bits to encode those errors. So it just takes some getting used to. 
Because if it is, that means I can say But here's an opportunity for design too. We don't particularly dwell on it here, but I'm checking explicitly that argc equals equals two, and then assuming that any other situation is a bad thing. But we could, of course, invert this and explicitly check if it's less than two, if it's greater than two. And so those are actually the kinds of variations that we might see in a problem set submission where students don't necessarily realize that you don't have to consider the less than case, the equal case, and the greater than case if you can somehow reduce two of those. Uh, error conditions to just the one here. Mm -hmm. And this is just a convention we adopt in CS50 here early on where we start to introduce the notion of returning an explicit value, which is tough because you students rarely see that return value, certainly not on the screen. You would see it in a debugger. You would see it in um, the, an environment variable after you've run the command like dollar sign question mark to see the return value of the last command or the exit value. Um, so for now, we keep things simple. And zero is good and one is bad. And we don't necessarily distinguish between multiple errors if there were multiple possible exits. Scenarios here. Because I've checked whether and here too, I'm, I'm continuing CS50's no. style of so using curly braces even now around one line aside, statements just to maintain consistency never and sort of a visual one, uh, a recall of scratch or other tools and what it looks like. Long. You, the program, have you considered in the past creating some sort of like a wrapper for that program. environment variable to find out exactly what the error was so that you could actually just spit that out to students and have them see? That is a very good idea. Exit 50. Exit 50. <laughs> Problem is they'd have to remember to run it immediately after, and the people that don't, they that run some intermediate so steps, might be confused. If you at least use like the, this, yeah. string, if you just bracket, use it as an alias like for the uh, star star uh, question mark, mm -hmm. dollar sign question mark. Though we could wrap the whole shell, the whole bash environment, and just keep oh a history of the exit values of all recent commands. Or just somehow merge that with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just merge that with the history. Yeah, yeah. Come back to that. that makes sense. Other questions on I like how you think. <laughs> Just to make more more work for us. Well, the funny thing is now I'm going to have to watch CS50 explain to remember what it, yeah. what we need to right, right. add. <laughs> so we need the CS50 explain explained. <laughs> Short answer is we just got lucky. Generally speaking, a computer allocates memory in chunks. And it gave me a big enough chunk that I got I away without being noticed. I said this is a meaty lecture. Oh, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm engaged there. Are you? No, I do regret that we didn't dive quick, more quickly into the demonstrations. We do get there, so we're, we're building. It's only getting better. Is it? In fact, look, there's, a, there's a stress balls in the background there. That looks like yeah. a fun giveaway. We've got the phone book from week zero that's been resurrected somehow. That's got to mean something cool is on the horizon. Have you taped the phone book? No, it's another phone book. Oh. It's probably a different city, too. Continuity error. <laughs> it's getting really hard to find phone books. Where, where do you source them now? Um, eBay, uh, though no, they're not cheap on eBay, market. though thankfully, you get, uh, uh, you get black market yellow books? Get yeah, we, we get bootleg Who market. sells their, their yellow books? For a lot of money, people are really, really? exploiting us, yeah. people who need phone books. Um, but the, the mother <laughs> of one of our students so very recently question. actually uh, uh, mailed us here, some 18 phone books, the thick there. ones too. These oh, are the wow. good phone Four. books, They're the good it's stuff. New York City? <sighs> New York City ones? For, it might have been New York, not New York City, but okay. I think it might have been New York. Um, so we have an arsenal now of some 18, maybe 17 now. Wow, so you can, you can go clear for another dozen years, huh? Well, I go through quite a few a year. Really? I don't have much material, so I just I bring a phone book anyway. Where I got. I mean, yeah. I think this is the oldest demonstration in CS50 is the tearing the book. Good question. Yeah. Is How many books did you have to tear to practice anything? before it's you really nailed it? It's <laughs> before, you were, before you were comfortable is, being on stage. I've never once practiced tearing the phone book. Oh, what you see is what you get. <laughs> I've tried tearing it the other way, it just doesn't work. The other way? Oh, you mean like the, the real way? Yeah. The impressive way. I'm tearing it down the, the like so one millimeter spine. Isn't there? There must be a YouTube video on the. Oh, there is. We played it in the past. Yeah, really scary guy ripping the thing. We had the contents of my computer's memory looking roughly like I mean, that kind of <laughs> is not the correct way for the demonstration ago, either, though, because you're just getting rid of, no, just you're getting rid of the wrong, rap, the wrong of half charm, of the columns. Right? Though someday we should find a, a particularly <laughs> strong student <laughs> to come up on stage and, and do that and outdo me. So if I really want to be <laughs> that would add value, I think. I should really be drawing it a little more like this, whereby in that would be amazing, actually. indexes, yeah. Of my RV There's array. apparently there a technique. I've watched uh, how-to videos on YouTube for this. 
And now the white lie we're supposed <laughs> to say is that <laughs> Too the much information? Play no. like this. In fact, you're just contradicting yourself when you say that you never practiced this. I haven't practiced it. Uh -huh. We'll come back Watch. to that before uh -huh. long. <laughs> this is dot slash hello backslash zero. That being the special character. I actually think we spent too much time on this, too, because I'm kind of another one after bored. Jamila's name. So what is this? You said it now, Well, let me go ahead and open up two other examples that are available online. One is called argv1. Dash dot, uh, dot C, and the other is RGV2. So, um, <laughs> with all the attention <laughs> to this detail. This is a good show. Yeah, this is, this is great, A+. Plus. Thank you. We'll be picked up. So with all the attention to detail you, um, you pay attention to, why are there always reflections on the back of your laptop? That's what we've devolved to, talking about the reflections on the back of your laptop. There are some smudges on the laptop during this lecture. <laughs> are those smudges or are they reflections? They look kind of like the Oh, on the top? On the no, yeah. I think I had like cleaned it recently, and apparently the soap residue was still there. Really? The soap residue exactly. is that right? So whatever words I mean, the top left the corner? Prompt, yeah. It's going wow, this to is, them <laughs> <one> <laughs> <one> <laughs> is good material, folks. <laughs> this is quality. We will get some snacks. Let's just fast forward. <laughs> now let's keep it simple. Let's do nothing at first. <laughs> do nothing at first. <laughs> just like this, uh, <laughs> just like this program, lecture. Zero. If I now say food, I'm learning a bit. I'll two, take some notes on uh, how to read really? <laughs> week three. <laughs> who's who's going to rewatch these and uh, now write down all the, all the notes? Well, we'll, we'll just look for where the YouTube RV views drop off at what some <laughs> code and then <laughs> fix that part. Episode zero. So we can <laughs> then drop off. <laughs> that basic logic and make code that looks okay so in fair, now things get a little more by having a nested, I think nested for loop syntactically challenging so now what we're trying to do is iterate over so now notice the strings in argv and, and then the characters zero, within RC. each of those strings and now in line so it's one, a trick from last week. no it is i think because now we're really reducing the higher level concept that was presented in the form of those slides um, having the whole end, strings within those boxes and now showing that within those boxes we're really just an abstraction for what really itself so is an array of characters. I and now we're bottoming out at I actually what the lowest level representation of this information, which is just character after character after character. So I'm using J by convention. Hmm. We might use K, and if you have more than K, you probably have too much nesting, typically. But now notice my printf line is slightly different. I'm not printing percent S, I'm printing percent And here too, it was an opportunity, honestly, to introduce uh, two-dimensional arrays to New, try to begin before, the conversation about how you can certainly have multi-dimensional arrays and it really just depends on how you want to think about it. So argvi represents the ith word and argvij represents the jth character in the ith word. So by using square brackets followed by square brackets, this is diving first into argv's strings. And I do think this, this kind of thing is helpful because now anytime students see this, they'll now have a familiar, hopefully mental model and at least can and fall back on some canonical example here. like this. So now let me go ahead and open up a slightly bigger window so we can see this in action. Let me go into that folder. Do you have a fancy slide for this as well to show the oh. structure of oh. uh, little matrix? Not yet. No, we wait, wait until we get more to the discussion of memory management, I think, and pointers, which the I then tend to do a little more on the fly. fly. Now let me go ahead and do foo. Similarly hard to read, but it's indeed printing one character per line. And if I do bar, it's now printing those line by line. So the takeaway here so this so stupid much output that, wow, is really just meant to demonstrate. Where you can get and actually, this is a little bit. Well, this is as close as we get, but we still are abstracting away from the underlying um, pointers that are there in the memory addresses. Array, and then indexing into an array that was in that array, and just applying these same ideas to slightly more sophisticated examples. Do you but find that students are confused really at all about even since last the fact that, now, this is sort of uh, timely in that having an array within an array this, can be of different lengths? So you have of paper, you can kind of some it's a good question. A question array. hasn't come Certainly up, if you were to but that's a very fair point. I would anticipate that at some point. In a computer, mm -hmm. Now things are getting interesting. Like in array, really? You know, in fact, what's changed since 2007 in CSFD is my slide here that's meant to be an allusion so to the phone book nice. example. It used to be a photo from like Google Images of an actual phone book. Now it is the like digital incarnation of a phone book. So we, we are updating this course yeah. continually. You didn't <laughs> update the background of the slide to be black, though, to match the others. No, sometimes it, things just look better on white versus black, so I choose based on the content. I see. I see. Let's go so what is, what is about to happen? What is this? So this is fun. We used Over to do this with physical pieces of paper taped to a chalkboard. But now we're using our touch screen here. And we have some virtual doors, so to speak. What's your we've, name? Ajay? David? We've invited our volunteer right, to come so up on the stage. And Ajay is supposed to now find a number be behind the these doors. Uh, mm -hmm. Rather, seven Let's doors on the screen, a whole bunch of numbers. And I have told you nothing seven in advance. Seven is delivered to that. Agreed? 
in theory, binary All search would work out nicely. Mm. And for us he doesn't really have to worry about rounding number, up or down. So wait, each door has a number behind has it? Has a number behind it. Different number. Different number. And he has to find a specific a number, number. And that's the extent of the information the given. Yeah. And the reality is the best he can do here is random, because he knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he has to find 50. Yeah. Yep, this is where the things go completely <laughs> off the rails. But, very, now, the odds of that happening, of course, are well one in done. seven. Uh, right. So this demo had a okay. six-sevenths uh, chance of going well. Oh, but movies? Just, today we gave away DVDs or really? Blu-rays. I forgot. All right. so probably so Blu-ray. Hold on just one moment. <laughs> how? Let's, let's <laughs> There's me recovering, touching my face. Yeah. Uh, how did you go about finding the number fifty? Just <laughs> plowing ahead with the demo. So you chose randomly and got lucky. <laughs> Okay, excellent. So now, had you not gotten lucky, what else might have happened? Okay, you back up, order? rewind. If I go ahead and reveal these numbers here, they actually are in random order. And the best you could have done, frankly, is by ultimately in the order of the numbers. Did you know the order of the so numbers before? I did. Um, yeah. Which isn't uh, what we call an algorithm. Do you think there's so? This isn't double grasp. blind. Do you think he sort of but subtly provided him? Uh, no, I think he just got lucky. Really? I think his arm was situated such that the first number he touched was right there. But now if I instead claim that behind we should have someone in the back that numbers, changes the numbers <laughs> at yeah. the last minute right before they tap it so that the goal uh, now it is to also find So now the numbers are sorted now and this astute student here as we're about to see might realize that 50 was the largest value and so finding 50 is probably pretty easy if I use the same numbers. So I'm going to check the ends first to determine <laughs> so funny to see you get embarrassed. You're like, oh, this is get off my stage. <laughs> that was a good use of minutes. <laughs> so I, <laughs> let's let's take a look at one of Jay's predecessors, Sean, who wasn't quite as lucky. I'm glad I had this in the okay, bag so here since here, a few Sean years ago, back when we shot an SD. Sean was given the same challenge. Doors, this is the old school incarnation uh, of it, where we had a chalkboard and we just used pieces of paper of doors doors well behind which are the numbers. And what's great about this clip is, actually, is I love showing this clip because numbers, it's just it really is demonstrative of like the point of these in-class exercises, which is to get the students in the audience in the class to actually engage. And so as you'll see, it becomes a sort of Price is Right situation with people yelling at him, giving him advice. And the great, greatly amusing amusing thing about the top row is you can do no better than random. <laughs> so it's not clear what he's, what he's thinking about. No. <laughs> in, in, in fairness, I'm sure right, it's stressful 19. being in front of all of your classmates here in this situation. Oh, so yeah. 13. I'm sure he wants to do this correctly and might not appreciate that <laughs> correctly is, can be it's perfectly random. It's not a trick question. <laughs> One. So fun fact, when we transitioned from using a chalkboard to using a big touch screen a couple years ago, At this point, I had forgotten until the morning so of that lecture wrong. that I wanted to do this demonstration that day. And so I swear to, I only had a, like an hour or two before class, and I swear to God, <laughs> I was going to bring pieces of paper and tape Go and on. tape them to the digital touch <laughs> screen <laughs> because I didn't know if I had time to actually stuff. implement something. And then I'm like, OK, that would just be atrocious only and the work top mockery. So you got three left, so find the <laughs> and so I very quickly whipped that demo up that we use with AJ. Um, using HTML and JavaScript. Um, good job. Good job. <laughs> good save. <laughs> this is where it gets good. <laughs> and in the end, the fact that I kind of had this in my back pocket for class, like the patch fall, was actually a nice contrast to the <laughs> complete failure of the previous <laughs> demonstration. Oh. Seven! <laughs> nice. So in this one, you seem to have eight. So both of those Correct. I, it took me a few years to realize that when we so want, if we want to get to binary search, avoiding the issues of rounding when you have even numbers. Like if you have four doors and you want to pick the middle one, well, which one's the middle one? But if you have seven, that works out more cleanly. You could do fundamentally better in this second example. And indeed, that was Sean's first attempt with random numbers, just as before. But as soon as Apparently, Sean has never lived down the fact that I use this demo every year. He has blessed our showing the video. But. It's a great clip, I think. 
Yeah, exactly. So AJ's, uh, but the real feel of the class now has changed, and so what I'm realizing in watching this back, honestly, is that quickly, this is the good stuff. This is the fun stuff, I think, for a lecture environment or for a stage environment. And the earlier stuff was admittedly good time to get a snack. With all the videos. At least I say that. I mean, you and I say that based on you know our comfort with and familiarity with the material. So I don't think we should necessarily be too harsh on the value of actually walking carefully and methodically through fairly arcane or you know, syntactical you know material, the right but at least for me, and hopefully for students, there, this is the point the of a class where I think it becomes all the more fun and engaging, so especially when things don't go as planned. So you might have to move away from the uh, lost numbers in the future. I know, it's getting a little dated. Or have another, have another reference. I need to find another show. Well, put some, put, you have to put 50 not on the end. That's, I think that's the I know, here. but... It's one thing to be handed the Sometimes you're confined by like real-world arbitrary goals. Like, I want it to be the lost numbers and then add the number 50. Here's, here's a CS50 explained poll. If you understood the reference to the numbers, please let us know, because I think that number will be very small. Yes, please email danallen at cs.harvard.edu. <laughs> Answer this question now, and we, we're, we're all out of movies now. But we do a lot of people <laughs> get the lost reference. Thank you very much. Do they? Fewer people get my Let's go ahead Seinfeld and references and other such things. You, huh. uh, three of you here. Let's get some new faces. Now you think that's a bug? That's really just someone standing in front of the projector oh. in the back of the room. <laughs> I thought that was supposed to be like a cool Come sort on. of. Mm. Yeah. Right. No. Nope. So someone stood in front of the projector. For each of you, is a number. Classic. If you'd like to go so the reason the numbers are on the number, projector is just to make it easy for those folks to order themselves in precisely that order, because I just want to start from some default state. And it is pretty much random. I just kind of shuffle the numbers around. And so is this some sort of sorting thing? About to be. About to be. And so the arc here has been, first, we want to find numbers efficiently. And the takeaway, hopefully, from the demonstration involving Sean and Ajay was that if the numbers are ordered randomly, you can do no better than random. Like, um, and in fact, if a brute force from left to right or right to left is probably best so that you don't miss algorithmically any of the possible values. But as soon as we sort the numbers in that bottom row of values, you know, Jay didn't quite get us to that point visually, um, you can of course do much better. So that then invites the question, well, you might be able to search n doors much more efficiently in logarithmic time, not linear time, but what price do we pay up front to sort those values? Because thus far, the phone book's been handed to me, and the doors in the second row of numbers have been handed to me. So now we get to ask the question, what does it cost us to get random data into sorted order? There we go. Okay, I think a student was standing right. in the wrong place, so, so I just fixed it for them. Now we have <laughs> eight, one, three, seven, five. Okay, excellent. So the question. And now I'm using eight values, really just to be a little more conventional. I'm using a complete here, set of eight because so we mm -hmm. we're not searching anymore. We're just sorting. And in fact, for really sorting, I want there to be enough of an opportunity to do a bunch of swaps. So you're about to show us different sorting methods, then? Different sorting methods, and I've taken different approaches over the years here. So sometimes. Our data into some I ask the audience, so how can we go about sorting so these folks? These um, are in pretty much the tricky right part there is that you really do yield control, and the conversation can go in any number of I'm ways, good and bad. And so generally, I've tried to coax things along so that we roughly follow a certain narrative involving bubble sort, selection sort, insertion sort. No, not necessarily in that order, but so that at least we hit all three of those, which I think tend to lend themselves to early discussion better than something like quick sort and and something like merge sort, now the latter of which we do get to. But down the road. But an interesting way to start, to be honest, is ask students, OK, sort yourselves. And it's sort of this very visual mess, because humans are just using their intuition. They're realizing, oh, small numbers should go over roughly over there, big numbers over there, and they sort of dynamically correct. But that's not necessarily an algorithm we can express fairly concisely. So what we're trying to do is reduce sorting here to some Always basic heuristics, like a comparison or a swap, so is which kind of is indeed, now, which are indeed the ingredients to a comparison sort, all of which we're going to use, which all of these but are today. Seem to it seems like it's important then to so maintain the steps, so again, to not supply any, okay. any heuristics. And, and so it looked like you were going pairwise down um, to do some swaps. Mm -hmm. 
But like right here, I, I, don't, I don't know if you mentioned it, but it's important to mention, oh, we actually compare the first two and determine they're in the correct order, so we'll skip them. I think I said that. Okay. I would have said that. I, in fact, I kind of point at two people at a time, making exactly that point. Okay. And what's interesting here, well, so and here's my mixed feelings on approaching sorting in this way. We haven't told them what bubble sort is, or selection sort, or insertion sort. And we could do that fairly succinctly with some pseudocode. And maybe the algorithms, honestly, out of the gate would be a little more clear. Here, we're taking multiple minutes to try to work our way through it. But I think I still prefer it this way, even though it's a bit of a more uh, circuitous path that's subject to input from students that may or may not lead us to the right outcome quickly. Uh, I think it makes it more of a thought process, more of a problem solving process. And then at the end, you'll see we'll cap this off with an actual and a rapid visualization of the algorithm so that if this was a little too drawn out and roundabout for students, they can at least see a more concise definition of each of them. And in fact, here we're going to go. So this is a nice, well, <laughs> I said <laughs> kind of a um, uh, paradoxical way of saying it, but this is a nice Java applet. Um, <laughs> Java applets have very little utility, <laughs> um, but unfortunately a lot of academic demonstrations have been written, at least back in the day, as Java applets, so you kind of have to jump through hoops to get Java or the Java runtime environment installed on your computer or to improve the security controls. So this is always a pain in the neck. But this is a nice demo visually, I think. And I'm deliberately they're writing it slow. Big bar means big number, small bar means small number. And as each gets highlighted, much like I was pointing at students, we're deciding whether or not we need to swap them. But this too is not going to help students. So shortly I'll interrupt this and we'll just do it super fast so that you can kind of get an aggregate sense of what's happening. And indeed, the big bars are bubbling up to the top or to the right. I don't bother spending time on the comparisons or <laughs> getting an echo here. You say something and then uh, on stage then he, he says, says it. exactly the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> He's good. So harder to see with humans, but visually that's indeed what was happening. Yeah, so it's hard to see that when you have to have humans moving around at human pace. So why uh, then have the human demo if, if you just admitted that it's not quite so useful to demonstrating? So memorable moments. I think each serves a different purpose. At the end of the day, they're both meant to deliver uh, some familiarity with sorting. But it's also meant to keep people's attention engaged and to take the burden off of my voice alone and actually involve some of their classmates. Four is the smallest number I've seen. I'm going to remember that. No, two is better. I'm going to remember that. Six, eight, one, one is even And two, th I think there's Three, something to be said five, for the fact that okay, in some one, future quiz or some or question or problem so set where ahead, students are trying to remember, which was line, bubble sort. Here, I mean, actually remembering one or more of their eight friends who might have been up on stage and remembering, point. okay, How don't quite know like the pseudocode for it, but I remember that like my friends were kind of swapping each other and bubbling up and bubbling down in terms of the magnitude of the numbers. It's just to give them this sort of mental crutch to fall back on and to remember Switch something more than just Jacob, Jacob, some digital incarnation move. of it. Mm -hmm. Much more efficient just to have Jacob swap locations with Artie as opposed to forcing all four of these. <laughs> the hardest part of these demonstrations, especially since I haven't met most Artie of the students now, before, is remembering position. everyone's yeah. names yeah. embarrassingly. So if you ever see me just resort to uh, number two and number three, why don't you swap? It's <laughs> because I forgot this number two and number three's name, even if they told me five seconds before. It's just a lot of information all at once for me. I'm not very good at keeping it in mind. The number I've seen on this pass is three. If you con uh, come on out, where are we going to put you? And what's your name? Alana. Alana, we're going to have to evict you. But that is more efficient to just swap two people than to have multiple people actually sidestep. And over. again, we're solving now a problem here. Again, and to, to rewind, since we talked over what I was saying here. You could certainly, when you need to make room for someone, when inserting them into the right place, we could ser or selecting them into the right place, we could very, we could certainly just shift everyone down to make room. But that's going to incur some a quadratic cost over time, and so rather we want to do a more efficient and arbitrary transposition of two elements. Let's change this to this is why Java Apple. Yeah, reload when in doubt. And let's I don't see know why I was doing that. And start the visualization now. 
So same idea. Selections are you're iteratively going through the list, selecting the now smallest element and putting it at the beginning of the list. And that was unfortunate. The fact that this one went more visually faster than the previous one, even though asymptotically, which will ultimately make the point that these algorithms are equivalent in terms of the upper bound on their running time. To be in this order here. Seems like you'd want, so it looked like there was a uh, pull down for the array order, the element order. Is it element order? Oh yeah, and I chose random deliberately. Is, it, is there a best case, or rather a worst case of I don't remember in this applet. I think that might be, that might be a more consistent. More consistent for time, but it might, I, claim now I think, I guess with random order, it makes more sense for students to see the random order and understand the point of the sorting rather than if it was well, I like, to like reverse. reverse. Yeah. yeah that I think that silly. would be misleading. Right. Number two, I'm now going to that wasn't horrible, so hopefully that wasn't so too problematic that we got somewhat here. lucky with the so performance of those inputs. But I think especially at this so stage, people, more, people will take uh, that one are, instance as being I mean, very representative of the speed of that algorithm. Yeah. I, go, um, I mean, with the right software, right frankly, we could certainly make it random looking and, and ensure that it's sufficiently eight, random so that we don't get right lucky with the performance. Now, um, one, so that would be, I think, a good here, sort of right, mess up summertime project to actually improve, rewrite something like that ourselves. Let's so here you're actually having them move the music stands? For what's the purpose of that? Right here yeah, I'm trying beginning. to remember. So at the end of the day, because this seems to I'm kind of break the mental model that each of the stands is like so a location in memory that can store a from what it originally number. Was. I'm just doing the shifting at a different point. Now I'm at I three. don't we remember. Do more work again. <laughs> so let's push you out. Let's move eight, six, four, oh, oh. and three is going to go right there. So at least slight savings this time. Shifting. Seven, not too much work to be done. Um, so if you want to pop back, let's insert you. You might have mentioned and lastly, five, five, if you want to pop back. It could be. He might remember. You, you, you. Too bad you're not five is in place. So now I'm not sure why I did this. It might be that I meant. Graphically, let's do this no, algorithm. I don't know. I'm trying to reverse engineer this. One additional time. So this we shall call insertion sort. We'll run it just as fast mm. and start mm. it here. I see what you mean because I arguably the so music stands better, could represent the perfect, cells in the like array, and so therefore it's just the values of the humans with holding their sheets of paper that should move. Mm -hmm. right. So, so I was so not sure why I had them move the stands that time. So all of these algorithms seem to run at slightly different paces. In fact, which would you say is the best? In fact, I wouldn't. I cannot think of a compelling reason now. Sort yeah. I think I might have just thought it would be a good idea to use the music stands, and I just remembered at the end to actually do it. But if anything, I, well, aesthetically, it makes it a little cleaner, honestly. That was probably, no, because everything's on the same height, and people aren't getting bored holding the sheets of paper up. And so I think it makes for a cleaner visual. But weren't they putting the sheets down when they got to the position? Anyway? Yeah, that's true. I'm not sure. And that's a bit of a white lie too. When I say Let's assume as that not everything I do is <laughs> a good idea. You might be surprised to learn this. After <laughs> CS50 explained, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure I am. This is CS50 exposed. <laughs> that's right. I'm still sweaty, as you can tell, in week three here. I love that that student is trying his best not to look Let's bored. Like no, he's just, just got he's very engaged. rapt attention. What is going on? He's even, he's, the novelty of waving of hi, mom has, has kind of worn off a little bit. A well, it was not as bad as week zero, where I had the staff on stage for like 45 minutes. <laughs> Enjoying that time. Uh, uh, well, like this is delicious, in fact. <laughs> so we did our three well. sorting algorithms here. We don't, we'll come and back to merge sort because it takes a little more time to do justice to and to flesh out. And this is kind of a fun way of ending bars, and to tie so everything together, but consistent with my goal of trying to end everything with a little bit of song and dance and, and starting everything with the same. Mm -hmm. So this is a fun YouTube video that's made its rounds over the years that associates sounds with the various algorithms. Is this somehow 
pedagogically useful to have. It's, it's sounds, fun. Is it? It is. It's another, at the end of the day, it's another visualization of the algorithms, <laughs> and that's helpful to see bubble sort working like this, insertion sort was working as it does. The sounds are just kind of a way of really engaging people. And it's funny, there's one sound that always gets a chuckle, but no, it's not really adding anything fundamentally. This one gets a little amusing. But it's just like you just keep waiting for something interesting to happen. Like, come on, just there come on. Come on. <laughs> and then no satisfaction at the end. It just changes to the next one. <laughs> but Merge Sword is fun. Sounds like CS50. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Merge Sword's fun, and it's a nice way to end on, even though there's some others in here. That's Selection Sword. Something called Merge Sword. Merge Sword's amazing. Look at this. But you can kind of, this does help visualize what's going on in a way that the other demonstrations didn't necessarily. Mm. Well, I think that they're, one of the things that helps is that they are um, selective. Presumably the, the, the array is selected in a way that kind of will be representative of the sorting mechanism. Mm -hmm. I think it would be neat if you had some sort of software that you have someone, some staff in the audience that takes a picture of the students that are on stage. The software breaks it up into uh, eight and you have some... Careful, I think you're specking out a summer project. Oh boy, here we go. Oh, damn it. By far the best part of lecture now. Here we go. Why is it a four loop? Why not make it better? <laughs> this is CS50.